The next of our first persons, um, we're thrilled to have all the way from Washington, a man called Thomas Hargrove, a former investigative journalist turned what you might call a serial killer hunter. Uh, we're particularly glad to have Thomas because he, he was offered a TED talk this weekend in the US and he decided to, to do this gig instead because he, he thinks that investigative journalism is more important than TED talks. So we love him for that. Thomas. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, earlier this week, I was telling folks back home in, uh, in Alexandria, Virginia, about my upcoming excellent adventure here to London. Why are you going there? A lady lawyer friend of mine asked. Oh, I've been asked to give an inspirational speech, I said. Huh, she said. What will you speak about? Oh, I've been asked to give an inspirational speech about how to write computer algorithms. Huh, she said. Well, I'm glad I won't be in your audience. And I can understand why you wouldn't laugh, because you are the audience. When, um, when James invited me back in June to be one of your uh, speakers today, he, um, he said that Europe has been hit as hard by changing media patterns uh, for investigative journalism as has the United States. He said, perhaps we can use computers to fill in for our declining numbers. I thought that was only fair. Computers and the communication revolution were at the source of many of our current financial challenges. I was a print journalist for 37 glorious years, but I must confess, not one of the institutions for which I worked still exist. So what can we ask computers to do? There we go. My first job in journalism was as a police reporter for the now defunct Birmingham Post-Herald in Alabama, a good little newspaper. I was there when the American South and really all of the United States was transfixed by the Atlanta child murders, which began in 1979 and ended with the arrest of Wayne Williams in 1981. The Atlanta police were roundly criticized for not sooner recognizing the pattern that an unusually large number of unsolved homicides of African-American youth had occurred. Why hadn't they sooner noticed the similarity of victims and the methods of killing? I later attended criminology symposiums where the Atlanta case was discussed. And I learned at those meetings that the struggles of the Atlanta police were actually nearly universal for law enforcement. Years later, after I founded the Murder Accountability Project, a nonprofit, and started giving demonstrations to police on how the data we've assembled might be useful in their active and cold case investigations, I met uh, criminal justice professor Stephen Edgar, who in the early 1980s gave the phenomenon a name, linkage blindness. It has to do with how homicides are investigated, really pretty much all over the world. If someone's murdered, an investigator is assigned to the case. Someone else is murdered, usually a different investigator is assigned to the case. If there are commonalities in the murders, those commonalities only get recognized if the two detectives happen to have a conversation over the water cooler. If those two killings occur in, jurisdiction, in, in different jurisdictions, that conversation never happens. We do have an official data source in the United States, which really is kind of rare in the world. The FBI maintains something called the Uniform Crime Report, which is meant to be a body count of how many major crimes occur in every jurisdiction. But it also includes, well, I'll get into that in a second, a separate very valuable data set. I became familiar with this back in 2004 when I was working for the now defunct Scripps Howard News Service. Um, I was doing a story about the optional crime, which is prostitution. In some cities, prostitutes are arrested vigorously by a very large vice squad. In other cities, only the Johns are arrested. In many cities, hardly any arrests are made. So I wanted to study the phenomenon, and I acquired from the University of Missouri's database library a copy of the, of the UCR. 
and we did a story that played very well. After all, it was about sex, and it was a data-driven story, so it was respectable even for family newspapers. There was an unexpected benefit from doing the prostitution story, uh, besides me having interesting conversation with sex workers. The database librarian at Missouri, at no additional cost, threw in a copy of something called the Supplementary Homicide Report, a database I'd never heard of or seen before. When I opened it, I saw thousands of rows of individual murders, the age, race, sex of each victim, the weapon used to kill the victim, the circumstances which were the police theory as to why the murder occurred, and if an arrest was made, demographic information about the offender. And I don't know where these ideas come from, but it came immediately when I first opened the database. I wonder if we could teach a computer to spot serial murder. From the ancient Mishnah, one of the fundamental works of Jewish oral law, we are told, and I quote, find thyself a teacher. We needed to know what serial murders look like in FBI crime data. So we picked as our teacher, Gary Leon Ridgway. Perhaps you know him as the Green River Killer. Ridgway was convicted of killing 48 teenage girls and young women starting in 1982 until his capture in 2001 after DNA typed him to some of his victims. He was captured after one of the longest and most intensive crime task force investigations in US history. He was a suspect early on. It was a very good investigation that went on for 19 years. He was a suspect early on, but Mr. Ridgway passed a polygraph. He was later convicted uh, based upon hard evidence for 48 individual murders. He claimed to have done more than 70, and no one really disputes that, but he was convicted uh, for the, for the uh, recovered remains of 48 women the largest body count known in US history. Could we use comp FBI computer files, which don't contain a lot of information, to tell us that something god-awful happened in Seattle in the 1980s and 1990s? The University of Missouri got wind of what we were doing and sent us the free services of a very clever journalism graduate student named Liz Lucas, who wanted to learn computer-assisted journalism methods. We spent a summer in 2010 finding 100 procedures that do not work. Did Ridgway cause a statistically noticeable spike in the general murder rate in Seattle? Or in the rate of female murders? Or in the rate of murders involving unusual weapons or circumstances? All that proved negative. The only positive finding was a slight uptick, and it was slight in the percentage of female murders that went unsolved in Seattle. As I was um, uh, saying goodbye to Liz, she had to go back to Columbia, Missouri to defend her master's thesis. On our last day together, I told her what might work would be to cluster the data into smaller groups, looking for clusters that had a noticeably low clearance rate. After all, Ridgway's victims did have a very slight impact on Seattle's overall clearance rate for female murders. What eventually worked is the algorithm you see here. You can download this algorithm at our website. We give every murder, and we now have over 790, uh, 769,000 uh, case files. We give every murder a murder group number based on the geography of the killing, the victim's sex, and the weapon used. Then we aggregate the data and calculate the percentage of killings that um, was solved in each group. So we take uh, way more than half a million murders, we turn them into about 10,000 groups, and we look for those groups that have a very low clearance rate. When we do, th when we do this, Ridgway's victims stood out in stark relief among the nation's murders. Because women are usually murdered by intimates, by a husband or a boyfriend, or someone living in the same household, police generally solve 75 to 80 percent of female murders. But among this particular cluster, only one murder in six was solved because he got away with it. 
Most of Ridgeway's victims were reported to the FBI as having been killed by other or type unknown weapons. That's because he was very adept at hiding his victims, sometimes in the Green River Valley, other times in other locations out of doors. The bodies were exposed to weather, and so coroners had a hard time determining the cause of death. A very bright young man, Washington Post reporter Andrew Tran, earlier this year has created a free online course to teach the statistical program R to journalists. He spent an hour in one of his videos d demonstrating how to load R data and how to translate this algorithm into R. Uh, Andrew, by the way, has a piece of two Pulitzer Prizes, very bright guy. I commend that class to you if you want to learn R. So, what do we have here? We've created an algorithm, sure, it's a series of mathematical steps that produces a solution. But what we also have is a statistical model intended to locate a particular kind of murder. What are the standards for these? And uh, uh, frankly, the best standard is one written by the late, great British statistician George Box. This is what he actually wrote in one of his essays, what it usually gets translated as, all models are wrong, but some are useful. So did we develop a useful model? The algorithm we were producing, uh, the algorithm we wrote was producing dozens, even hundreds of suspicious looking clusters, many clusters that were larger than the Seattle cluster of the world's most dangerous known serial killer. We decided to start testing the alg algorithm results. We took the 10 largest cities that had significant clusters and we started calling local police. We sent them the, what the database was saying were suspicious and asked, are these um, serial? In most cases, they were known serial killings by men who were arrested. In several cases, though, the police didn't know what we were talking about. In one case, I contacted Youngstown, Ohio police captain Rod Foley, a really decent guy who later became chief. And I left a voice me message saying, I'm Tom Hargrove from the, uh, from the uh, Scripps Howard News Service in Washington. We have a statistical technique that might identify serial murder. We think you've had too many rape murders of middle-aged African-American women in the 1990s. That's quite a message to leave on someone's voicemail. Um, half an hour later, he called back and said, I just went down to interview my senior detectives and they told me something I did not know. We had a serial killer. We definitely knew we had one in the 90s and we never got him. And so we started a new investigation. Unfortunately, all of the rape kits, both at Youngstown and the uh, surrounding jurisdictions had been thrown out because they might have caught that guy still. We, um, we also had a similar pattern, 15 unsolved strangulations of women in Gary, Indiana. And I want to show a rather clever video that Freethink Media did about this. this you're about to see the actual uh, representation of the, the clusters the algorithm was showing us. We first start with Seattle. And once we got the machine to tell us, yes, something happened in Seattle, those are all the other clusters, some of them much larger than, uh, than uh, Seattle, including Gary, Indiana. And so I, I tried for months to get the uh, Gary Police Department to concede the possibility they might have a serial killer, or at least to have a conversation, to no luck. Four years later, uh, Hammond Police next door to Gary arrest Darren Dion Van, who admitted that he's been at this for many years and then took them into downtown Gary and recovered six other um, bodies of victims that nobody knew about, who, all who had been strangled. Um, when the next day after Mr. Van's arrest had been announced, the Gary Police Department had a, um, had a press conference and the first question the chief was asked was, did you know, chief, that you had a serial killer? And his answer was, absolutely not. We had sent letters, emails, phone calls on a daily basis, registered mail to the police chief and to the chief of police, to the um, mayor of Gary, Indiana, and never got a hearing. Police refused to speak to me about the possibility of an active serial killer. 
And as a result of that experience, we decided, the board of directors of the Murder Accountability Project decided we better not be keepers of secret knowledge. And so if you log into our site and go to the Murder Groups tab, you will see this. And it's not an image, it's not a static image, it's a live interaction with our um, 600 and, uh, 796,000 murders. You change the settings, you'll get different results. We don't know if all of these are serial. I will tell you that all of these clusters had breathtakingly low clearance rates. And I will tell you that the most charitable explanation for this is the presence of a serial killer. Also, um, it should be stated that uh, seven women died after I tried to contact Gary authorities. For a computer model to be useful to a journalist, it must be publicly available for review, which is something your lawyers may not like. But if you're going to um, take charge of data, process it in entirely new ways, and then make news out of those results, you are, I think, morally obligated, ethically obligated, to tell the world what you've done and how you've done it. You should be using publicly available data. Or, if it's once privately held data, data that you've developed, you must make it public. Why? Because you must allow your results to be easily reproduced by others. This is computational or augmented journalism, and it should make use of best available science. I recommend strongly that when possible, that you partner with top scholars or scientists. We did. We had the nation's top criminologist um, involved with our project, and he was very glad he did get involved. Um, it should always be data-driven, so that if the data don't support what you think your model is producing, don't challenge the data, throw out the model and try again. And again, you must provide public access to all elements. The Associated Press last year produced a brilliant report on the future of computational journalism. I recommend it to you. Broadly speaking, artificial intelligence promises to reap many big rewards for journalism in the years to come. Greater speed, accuracy, scale, and diversity of coverage are just some of the results media organizations are already seeing. This is a new wave of technological innovation, and it's no different than any other that has come before it. Success still relies on how human journalists implement these new tools. Artificial intelligence is man-made meaning that at all ethical, editorial, and economic influences considered when producing traditional news content still apply in this new age. Again, I'm Tom Hargrove. Uh, that's my contact information. I would adore talking to anyone who wants to have a conversation about how to develop statistical models and algorithms for news coverage. I've had many such conversations. Some of the best and brightest in this field are in this room. Thank you.